Welcome to In the Studio on Davis Media Access. I'm Tim Gaffney. Well, thanks to the tireless efforts of Andy Jones, poetry is alive and well in the Davis community. He hosts the Thursday night poetry reading series on the first and third Thursday of every month. That's at the John Natsoulis Gallery in downtown Davis. Each event features readings by one or more poets and includes an open mic segment. Andy is himself a poet, as well as an MC, faculty member, and academic director at UC Davis. He's a radio talk show host, public speaker, essayist, and all around arts advocate. Andy has taught writing and literature classes at UC Davis since 1990 and has hosted Dr. Andy's Poetry and Technology Hour on KDVS. That's on Wednesday afternoons at 5 p.m. He's done that since 2000. Andy is the Poet Laureate Emeritus of Davis, and his poems have appeared in many small journals and newspapers, including Epicenter, A Light Left On, The Homestead Review, Snakeskin, The Blue Moon Literary and Art Review, and the Sacramento News and Review. Andy's book, Where's Juki, was published in 2014 and includes essays by his wife, Kate Duren. His book, In the Almond Orchard, Coming Home from War, represented Yolo County veterans and was supported by the California Arts Council. In 2006, Andy's book of poetry, Split Stock, was published by John Natsoulis Press. Andy, welcome to In the Studio. Thank you so much, Tim. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, great to have you. Well, I hoped we could start off by hearing a little bit about your personal interest with literature. What inspired your love for poetry and when did you begin to write your own verse? I attended a Waldorf school in Washington, D.C., where I grew up. And as a result, uh, I was introduced to texts, to stories, to myths all the time as a kid. And my mom was a children's librarian when I was a wee lad. And between that and my father's love of theater, I was surrounded by stories and uh the world of the imagination, and it seemed inevitable that I would delve into that world as I started to think about uh, my undergraduate major at Boston University, where I was an English major, and then as a graduate student at UC Davis, where I earned my master's and my PhD in English, all with the focus on 20th century poetry. So I, I'd say that the genesis of this uh, love of words and stories and, and images uh, came from my childhood where I was encouraged to use my imagination. And then I just continued to foster it uh, as a, a reader. And then once I became a, a graduate student and after as a performer as well. So what can poetry uniquely express? What does it do that prose cannot? It's a good question. I think that one thing that poetry can do is give us an opportunity to uh, approach, to noodle upon, to enact our understanding of the ineffable, of the transitory, of uh, the sublime. And I think that insofar as poetry represents uh, the, the consciousness the uh, overheard internal conversations of one particular person, it gives us a sense of what it means to be human, uh, what it is to have thoughts and to negotiate this world. Uh, we come to a clear understanding of who we are, how we feel, what we think with poetry. And poetry allows us to explore this in um, an integrated way so that we're not separating out, for instance, the logical part of ourselves from the emotional part of ourselves, or uh, separating out uh, fantasy from history. Rather, poetry uh, allows us and encourages us to delve into all of this in such a way that uh, we're not dependent upon uh, the worlds of logic and contingency and sequentiality Instead, as I said before about the imagination, uh, we can explore worlds, many of them internal worlds, that have uh, an odd sort of uh, 
imaginative logic, and uh, it offers a, a delightful uh, respite, if you will, from the the rush of responsibilities and social media intrusions and um, ridiculous politics that sometimes we want to take a break from all of that. And poetry, whether we are readers or writers, gives us a chance to do that. I'm feeling more relaxed just sort of imbibing and digesting all of that that you just said uh, about poetry. Thank you. And, you know, I want to get back to or get to Poetry Night in particular uh, in a moment. But before I do, in, in more general terms, uh, but predicated on the fact that you started Poetry Night is that this isn't just a solitary exercise, though, right? Poetry is, is, is not just something one does alone. Um, so why or how is poetry an important cultural resource or what does it add to the community? I think that all of the qualities that I was just speaking of, um, they are all wonderful when um, reflected upon individually. Uh, they give us a chance, for instance, to uh, commune with great books. But we know that poetry, if it's going to thrive, is going to depend upon um, new blood, new challenges, um, new ideas, uh, uh, new speakers, and you're not going to find that in isolation. You're going to find that in a community. I think that, that we run a risk, or people like I, who have a PhD in English, I run the risk of thinking of poetry as something to be um, studied, of something to be uh, taught, of something to be analyzed, when in actuality, um, and and let me point out, I've made a pretty good living engaging in those sorts of activities. But um, in actuality, poetry offers an opportunity to uh, bridge divides, to imagine how people radically different from ourselves uh, think about the world, express the world. It gives us a chance to explore literary and cultural uh, avenues and threads that uh, are um, are nascent, are coming into being right now. And for that, you need to find a community. You can't depend only on your library card and office hours with a poetry professor like myself. And so uh, this means that uh, increasingly we want to uh, tap into that energy. Because we live in the city of Davis, a lot of that energy comes from the university students who cycle through here on a regular basis. It's a great advantage that our city has, and it's a great advantage that the poetry community has, that uh, they bring all of these ideas, new words, workshopped poems, but also audiences for the established poets who I'm able to um, convince to come to uh, Davis, to the beautiful John Etzulis Gallery, and give a performance. And it, it provides a sort of uh, emotional, maybe spiritual, certainly literary, maybe aesthetic education to complement what students are, are learning in the classroom. I think there's also a lot to learn from uh, the, the town and the gown, right? So the, the gown would be uh, the academic robes of professors and so forth. But the town would be the wonderful people we have in the city of Davis who have explored poetry as uh, writers, but who are not um, officially trained in this sort of uh, literary production. But Poetry Night and other reading series that offer an open mic, uh, they provide an opportunity for um, new poets, perhaps not new people, uh, we have, you know, readers in their 80s and 90s who come to Poetry Night as well as the youngsters I spoke of before, but people who are newly exploring or re-exploring poetry and finding that uh, the, the community connection and reading before an audience provides a sort of uh, electric thrill that you're not going to find anywhere else. And, uh, and therefore, uh, a poetry series like the one I run uh, will offer a great opportunity to 
bridge these divides, discover new authors, and make connections, make new friends that would probably not uh, be made otherwise. I, well, that's wonderful. Thank you for all that. And, and, and I wanted to add, by the way, that about a year ago, we had one of your uh, more mature poets uh, on the show, Allegra Silverstein, uh, which was right. uh, wonderful. And we had a wonderful time. Um, I wasn't going to out her as the 90 something uh, poet <laughs> who comes to every poetry night, but that's who I was thinking of. Uh, Allegra you, you is our first ever not... poet laureate. Okay. Yeah. Um, she's the first ever poet laureate of the city of Davis. She uh, is always the last reader at uh, the open mic at Poetry Night. She uh, only misses Poetry Night when she is uh, out of town in uh, Wisconsin visiting family. And I uh, introduce her as I would uh, a prize fighter uh, at uh, a boxing match. And so people are always looking forward to the last poet of the evening, in part because of how I ham it up with uh, the introduction of this uh, this uh, fine 90-something poet that we're lucky to have in one, town. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I wanted to dig down a little bit more on something, and that is the you, you've, you've done a wonderful job and an eloquent job describing the value of poetry and the contribution. But let's talk Turkey. And now here's the social scientist meeting the, uh, sure. the English professor. And that is, so what is what do you see as in fact the appetite out there for poetry and and i mean both in davis and across the country uh are, are people still demanding poetry are, are people still showing up and and i'd also be curious to to hear if you think this has changed over time um and whether it, it will change in the future yeah well uh thank you professor gaffney that is an excellent question and <laughs> It reminds me of something that one of my colleagues in the English department wrote in an essay recently. And I don't know if this was targeted directly at me, but he said that the that generally speaking, the participation in poetry readings in America, that the non-participation hovers somewhere around 100%. And so what does that mean? <laughs> that whereas if we were having this conversation 150 years ago, poetry would be... Um, an obligatory and beloved part of every educated person's way of investigating the world. And that is not only because of the fine quality of poetry that was available 150 years ago, but because it had so many fewer uh, competitors in the form of uh, modern media, uh, let's say. But also uh, we recognize that poetry could be read out loud and shared and loved in uh, dining rooms and um, uh, public squares and, and so forth. It gave people an opportunity to participate in culture and it had a low barrier to entry. Uh, poetry has sometimes been called uh, the, the poor person's art because so few materials are needed to uh, participate in poetry. Uh, that said, um, and, and uh, recognizing the point that my uh, colleague at UC Davis was making, um, we ran the risk in, uh, say, the second half of the 20th century of poetry becoming um, more isolated, more esoteric, more academic, um, more obscure, and therefore less relevant to larger audiences. Uh, and so uh, that is regrettable. When I started Poetry Night in 2006, I had already lived in great poetry cities like Washington, D.C., and Boston, and London, and Chicago, and Berkeley. And I noticed that uh, not only were great communities uh, created by poetry series, but this is where I got to see so many incredible authors who really enriched my uh, life as, uh, as a poet and as a scholar of, uh, of literature. Um, and so I noticed that uh, the English department where I got my master's and PhD was not doing sufficient work to introduce poetry to the community. And I felt that I needed to uh, take that on. And that's kind of the UC Davis way that um, uh, if if you see a need and uh, it's not being met, 
then often students will uh, form a club and start to address that need themselves rather than waiting for uh, adult uh, permission or leadership to do so. And mm -hmm. so uh, with regard to um, uh, setting up the poetry series, I was recognizing how things were changing and how poetry was finding additional audiences, um, but mostly it was doing so insofar as it was moving away from the academic, the esoteric, and the difficult. And so uh, this happened for a number of reasons. One is that there had been a kind of conflation between hip hop culture and spoken word culture, uh, such that um, a whole generation of young people were discovering poetry, poetry infused with a funky or hip hop beat, um, and often taking on uh, gritty, sometimes urban topics, and that this was infusing new life and new energy into poetry uh, and, uh, and growing audiences for poetry. Another way that that happened was um, with the advent of uh, the internet and the World Wide Web that uh, Twitter and Instagram became uh, great um, venues, uh, great modes of communication for um, micro um, messages. And these micro messages are not only uh, silly uh, rants or trollish remarks about uh, one's political opponents, but also uh, because of the constraint of 140 characters within Twitter, for example, it um, intrigued people, it compelled people to say, how can I say something aesthetically meaningful uh, with these sort of limitations? And those limitations are analogous to those of the poet who had to write a sonnet with 14 lines or um, someone who is writing a haiku and uh, counting the five, seven, and five syllables of the individual lines. So, um, and then the, the third uh, element that has grown poetry is the use of video. That uh, YouTube is a place where one can find many poetry readings. Uh, there are YouTube influencers who have created channels for their uh, poems. And what this allows is for different communities to pop up that are not limited by geography. I've talked largely about how Davis has been a great place to spawn a poetry scene uh, because of the, the wonderful uh, mix of people that we have here. But many poetry scenes are um, growing in diffuse ways because the people who have these niche interests are able to connect with one another um, without regard to geography. So uh, these elements have also grown um, audiences for, for poetry. Poetry um, now, as with 50 and 150 years ago, is still best communicated in person though. And I think that uh, poetry series like mine and um, other activities that happen uh, on campus. Sacramento is a very uh, active poetry town that uh, you, you really have the most uh, meaningful poetic experiences when you can go and see someone read. And I think that unlike with most other successful authors, poets, if they're gonna be uh, successful, they're gonna do so through selling books at actual events where you can connect with the author and see how he or she has enacted something beautiful, poignant, necessary in one of their poems. Well, Andy, thank you. That was neither academic nor esoteric and uh, equally satisfying to a social scientist who happens to love poetry as well. Glad to hear it. One final question. You're, you're a man of many vocations and avocations. You get to pick three of those hats, only three to describe yourself on your epitaph, what are they? Uh, that's pretty easy. That would be a uh, husband, uh, dad, poet, and uh, and I think you know these are these are all centers of emotional gratification to me. And although we live in a city with many uh, accomplished people, I think all of us at the end of our lives 
will best remember um, not those uh, academic accomplishments and uh, other vocational accomplishments, but uh, the time that we've spent with the people who we love the most. And I'd say that uh, for me, that um, is embodied in uh, the uh, lucky place that I find myself uh, being married to my wife, Kate, uh, being dad to my three kids, Geneva, Juki, and Truman, and then also to be able to delve into the world of poetry, not only because of uh, the sort of uh, literary excitement that it sparks in me as a, a reader, but because of the community of friends that I've made through uh, Poetry Night and the larger um, community of the arts here in the city of Davis. Andy, thank you. Beautifully said. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk about the Poetry Night series and to talk about poetry in general and your own passions. As a reminder to all of you out there, the event is held on the first and third Thursday of every month at the John Natsoulis Gallery. That's at 521 First Street in Davis. The featured readers begin at 7 p.m. and that's followed by an open mic segment at 8 p.m. Uh, according to the website, attendees are encouraged to arrive early to secure a table and to sign up for a spot on that open mic list. And for more information uh, on the series, you can go to poetryindavis.com. This is Tim Gaffney, and you've been watching In the Studio on Davis Media Access. Thank you, Tim. <laughs>